David Waldman. Hey, good morning, everybody. How you doing? It is Thursday, June 3rd, 2021. Ready to roll on another show. Anything exciting happening in your life? Uh, there's lots of stories we can gather up. There's Coca-Cola cans to be opened, as a matter of fact. And, uh, well, many things happening according to the people who have been alive and awake on the internets earlier than me, including, for some reason... I mean, just in case you were wondering whether there are still any rules, apparently there are not. Fox and Friends just going crazy this morning, or Fox and Friends and and The Five, and I don't know whether some of it was last night and some of it is this morning, but I guess there's just no rules anymore. Uh, Greg Gutfeld, Gutfeld? I don't know how he pronounces his name, never watched him on uh, TV before, but uh, much chatter (laughs) about uh, the clip of him that's circulating which looks to be from i guess at least last night um saying i don't know what i mean i guess he's sitting there basically saying i saw one summary of what's there i saw a video clip and the video clip needs some context and the other people commenting on it have given it some context i guess it's basically uh gutfeld or whatever his name is discussing an upcoming uh, meeting at one of the world summits, I guess, between Biden and Putin. And I don't know from what perspective this guy is coming, but he says basically Putin has to do something. If he killed Biden, that would be something. And he kind of gives it a thumbs up there. And I, I'm not certain, you know, like how you get away with that. As uh, I retweeted that around, just saying, I wonder if there are any rules about this stuff. I'm not sure. But uh, Wolfram. Everybody's pal on Twitter just say, hey, remember growing up and believing that if you said something like that over the phone, the Secret Service would be at your door in five minutes? I I do recall that that was an issue at one point in time. Uh, I, I don't know. What can I tell you? I can't explain it. The rest of Fox News seems to be focused on... Uh, well, their usual task of trying to find the outrage of the day, and they haven't really landed on one just yet. Bobby Lewis over at Media Matters finds their first attempt from this one from Fox and Friends, I believe, this morning. Uh, They hosted Lara Trump because she's getting ready to run for Senate. And you know what Fox News does. They they host Republican candidates as analysts who then give analysis that says uh, America's ready for me in, in office. So here she goes. Anyway, she was brought on, interestingly, to deny... The rumors that Maggie Haberman uh, is, uh, well, was, I guess, chiefly responsible for circulating, although she wasn't circulating as a rumor. This was reporting she was doing, saying that, uh, I guess, sources in inside Mar-a-Lago, well, I don't know, were telling her that Trump was, and this is easy enough to believe, was walking around basically telling people, yeah, 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 I hear I'm going to be reinstated as president uh, maybe as soon as August. And that caused something of a sensation because, as uh, Bobby puts it, it's quite right when he does it this way. Uh, This is a QA, and a he says, about Trump's demented claim that he'll be president again in August. However, he points out that what they're doing here is framing the question, he says almost, but I think it's pretty much yes, Uh, he's right. They frame the question as a smear from the mainstream media and not a deluded ex-president fanatically believing one of his favorite TV personalities simply because the guy fights for Trump. And yes, it's absolutely presented by the Fox hosts. I mean, Lara says, no, look, you know, she presents it not as that's unlikely to happen so much as that's not what Donald Trump is doing. Nobody's saying that. It's the left-wing media trying to set him up saying this and they absolutely play along with that i guess that's the plan so maybe that's the outrage of the day they go on apparently to say uh yeah well by denying it you've just blown up the mainstream media the lying left-wing media's narrative for the next 72 hours 
Uh, they seem to believe that that's uh, that, that somehow we have some interest in making up that story. I don't know. I mean, I guess I I would find it entertaining if that were true. I would find it less entertaining if he really tried to do something like that. But uh, it's easy enough to believe. So I guess it's a possibility. We'll hold it out there as a possibility. But it's an interesting framing, to say the least. The other candidate, I guess, for outrage of the day, also uh, unearthed by Bobby Lewis, doing remarkable work there. Uh, and also, of course, coming from Fox and Friends, hosting uh, South Dakota Governor Christy Garden Gnome and uh, her claim. She apparently... Uh, sued in court and lost. So just like Trump, she's really good at getting stuff done and getting shut down by the courts. She was suing the Biden administration for denying her state, I guess, the a permit for the use of the federal lands at Mount Rushmore for a gigantic July 4th fireworks and celebration. And I think when the permit was requested, uh, we're basically, we were still in the throes of the coronavirus and the, the thinking was maybe not a great idea to you know give the imprimatur from the federal government to a mass gathering in South Dakota in the middle of the pandemic again. Also, given that they're uh, a lagging state in terms of bringing their rates down. But uh, anyway, but, uh, OK, fine. So there's a difference of opinion over whether or not you ought to gather for fireworks at the. Uh, at Mount Rushmore this at this point in time. But, of course, she goes on to say that the federal judge that denied the fireworks permit is, quote, part of the radical left's agenda to attack American freedoms with critical race theory and the 1619 Project, which is just like, wow. I mean, I guess I would have expected to hear her say, well, the judge who denied our our petition is certainly, you know, an activist, left-wing judge, but um, bringing in that uh, he made the decision somehow based on critical race theory in the 1619 projects just seems like, I don't know, well, I guess that's just her going for broke, right? She's running for president, and everybody wants to be on board with criticizing those things. Those are buzzwords at this point that just trigger all conservatives and check the right boxes for her when she's running for president. All right, well, uh, we'll see whether any of those things stick. Just an early alert system to let you know that uh, those things might show up on your radar during the day. Greg Dworkin has a uh, large raft of stories as usual. I see 24 notes in the queue. So we, uh, we're, in for, we're in for a lot here today, which is great. Good way to start. As a matter of fact, there's the little ringy dingy noise that says it's time to go. So good morning, Greg. How you doing? Uh, oh, you're in, you're out. There you go. Button. I hear you. How about now? Uh, if it sounds good. The button sounds Sticky really button. nice. Really? Okay. I'll give it a good you push whack. It and it keeps flashing. You push it and it keeps flashing. Hey, I got one of those. it's supposed to unmute me or yeah. Abby or whoever it is that we muted here. All right. Well, all is good now. And uh, I think we have an uh, early warning on the radar of all the outrages to look out for and laugh at if they happen on Fox News, if they start to stick. So right. Doors open for actual news. Well, if you, you know, like. I think what we, we should do is put the outrages in a bigger context. And so that's okay. really what we'll try to do today. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, you know, just uh, lightning round stuff first. I want to mention the uh, Israeli politics situation. Uh, it's where the parties have come together and decided that they do have enough votes to form a government. So that means that Netanyahu that will no longer be prime minister, which, of course, isn't the end of the story. Mm -hmm. oh. What they've done is they've uh, signed uh, agreements and given them to the uh, Israeli uh, president that they have enough votes to form a government. And then they get a confidence vote next week, I think Wednesday. And if they pass that, then Naftali Bennett will be prime minister for two years, followed by uh, Lapid, who will be prime minister for two years, assuming there's no elections in between and assuming all of that goes the way it's supposed to, which isn't necessarily true, and assuming that there's no confidence votes uh, that are going to be put off for a while, which could bring the government down and bring yet another different election, because that's the Israeli system. But the point of it all oh, is that yeah, even for the next week, uh, would be that uh, uh, Netanyahu isn't 
uh, prime minister anymore for now. And while he's out, uh, you know, his trial goes on. And uh, mm. even though uh, this isn't the end of him necessarily, uh, it might be the end of him in terms of the beginning. See, what he's going to try to do over the next week is uh, bribe, threaten and control people to uh, break away from the very fragile coalition. And uh, the problem with that is everybody hates Netanyahu and now they smell blood in the water and they get rid of him. So I don't know that they're going to do that. OK. Now, the people who are forming the government are a incredible mix of things. But uh, as uh, uh, Anshel Pfeiffer puts it, uh, Israeli uh, 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 politics just never had anything like this before. They have a, uh, a head of the Arab list yeah. meeting with Naftali Bennett, who came out of the settler movement. Hmm. Meeting yeah, okay. with uh, Yair Lapid, who came out of a, a centrist. He was a, a TV uh, personality. Oh, okay. So you have a mix of people We've there that. with very, very different point of views united in wanting to get rid of Netanyahu. Now, okay. uh, Bennett, although he is uh, possibly even more to the right of Netanyahu when it comes to Israeli nationalism, he basically wants to annex the West Bank. Sitting with somebody who represents the Arab voice in Israeli politics is just a remarkable, remarkable thing. And so uh, this particular uh, uh, thread from Guy Grossman is quite interesting. Israeli politics has had an unwritten rule. Arab parties can't be part of a coalition government. Yeah. One reason was that since the major political cleavage was the Palestinian conflict, there'll be no legitimacy to a compromise that doesn't have a Jewish majority. And the rule also served the purpose of depressing Arab vote. If Arabs know the representatives have no real power, why vote? Arabs are 18 to 20 percent of the population, but only 10 percent of the Knesset seats, which is the Israeli parliament. Mm -hmm. So in recent years, it's become clear mathematically that an Arab-Jewish partnership is the only path for forming a center-left government. But the informal rule had staying power, which is why Gantz, Benny Gantz, failed to form a government when he had the mandate from the president. In order for his uh, blue and white party to uh, to form a government, he'd have to, you know, compromise with the Arab list. Yes. And that was taboo. So he couldn't do that. But history can be ironical, writes Guy Grossman. The first major political figure to break the taboo was Netanyahu, who tried to form a government after election number four by including Ram, the Is Islamist party. OK. Which is the conservative Arab group. Huh. Netanyahu spent weeks normalizing them. And now the genie's out of the bottle and it ain't coming back. So once Netanyahu failed to form a government and the mandate was passed to Lapid, he was cleared to negotiate openly with Ram because Netanyahu had already said it was OK. Well, I guess so. I mean, uh, unless there's any kind of rule over there, like it's OK if you're. Uh, it's like getting a Trump Kutnick. endorsement and then negotiating with somebody. And then uh, the GOP says, hey, you can't uh, you, you can't Trump negotiate thing, with right? them. They're radical leftists, right. well, but Trump just endorsed them. So it's okay. I right. can do it. He invited them to Camp David with the Taliban. Yeah, exactly. exactly. Rahm demanded and will get special budgets for the Arab population to secure its support, which is unprecedented. In other words, the Arab list isn't asking for the department of defense, uh, you know, portfolio mm -hmm. as they like to say, you get a portfolio if you're a minister, Free uh, but uh, what they are doing is saying, why don't you just uh, not enforce the law that kicks us out of, you know, various places? Just don't All enforce right. it. You don't even have to overturn the law. Just agree not to enforce it. Oh, okay. And that's good enough for us. We'll I sign mean... on. All right. If that's the position, sure. I suspect, says Guy Grossman, that this mm -hmm. is potential of being a game changer for Israeli politics. If Arab parties can be part of a government and manage to leverage that for resources... Arabs have very good reasons to vote, just like Orthodox Jews who vote for resources and not ideology. Yeah, or people just like anywhere. the settlers who want money to go to the settlements. Hmm. They don't care about whether or not you're uh, left, right, or center. Just give us money. Oh, well, they might, but uh, money's good. No, just, uh, most people are like that when they vote. Yeah, sure. I mean, it, it should Some surprise Some people are anybody. committed to what you're doing, and most people are like, well, you know, uh, what they used to call kitchen table politics here in America. Uh, yeah, or transactional politics if you're Jared Kushner and Mr. Bonesaw. Yeah. Today has increased dramatically the likelihood of a future center-left Arab party coalition. Today marks a turn in the integration of Arab Israelis, notwithstanding all the many flaws of Lapid Bennett's government. Today is a historical day, truly. 
So this hmm. government uh, may fall. It probably will fall at some point. Uh, but it's opened up the door to things that just didn't exist before. And in that regard, stuff that's just not uh, uh, noteworthy. Yeah. Uh, there's stuff that's just not done happening in governments all over the place these days. Right. Right. Cool. All and, right. Uh, the stuff that's not done isn't always good, but you oh, know, right. there well, it is. This one's uh, not for example, bad. things that are not done. There's a story in the Washington Post today. To build a crowd for a pro-Trump rally, Nevada GOP consultant sought help from the Proud Boys. No. Oh, well, that, that's that how you get done. people to show up, you know, you beat them lost. up if they don't go, I guess. Here's a piece from Brendan Nyhan uh, on a new uh, uh, study. Elite rhetoric can undermine democratic norms. The effect of attacks on election legitimacy, no change in support for violence or democracy, but decreased trust in elections. OK. At least for supporters. Yes. Right. So uh, that's the background for a lot of what else is going on here. And um, in that regard, Casey Newton has a really interesting piece on a uh, platform called Platformer. Uh, oh, where he writes about deplatforming. Oh, that's platform. unfortunately uh, a, a paywall. But I'll give you the highlights of it because it's really interesting. <laughs> it's a wall in front of this platform. What the hell is yeah, going on here? Yeah. It's, it's half a house. Uh, uh, basically, the thesis of this particular piece is Trump's near instant abandonment of his blogging hmm. yes. illustrates that the real power of platforms like Twitter is not free speech. Hmm. It's free reach. Ah, OK. Yes, I'll agree. Right. Uh, and so uh, here, here are some of the highlights uh, from that piece, which I think are quite illustrative and, uh, you know, important uh, in its way. OK. OK. And he writes, as somebody who both found Trump and his presidency repugnant and who makes my living posting on the web, hmm. I was, of course, delighted to read about the former president's crushing defeat in the rough and tumble world of digital content creation, which is to say his blog failed. Yes. Why? Because nobody was reading it. But the lessons from Trump's failed blog are actually quite important and worth a moment's reflection as we wait for his next incarnation online. There are two primary questions we wind up asking about problematic users of social networks. The first is whether they should have the ability to post at all. Remember, okay. it was Kamala Harris during the Democratic debates who said, you know, Twitter should just throw Trump off. That was absolutely right. And, and she was. And yeah, she good. was right about a lot of things. They should make her vice president. The first is whether they should For have president. the ability to post at all or plat platform level freedom of speech. And the second is whether the platform should amplify their account or their post to other users, what the technologist Aza Raskin has called freedom of reach. In the wake of Trump's deplatforming, his supporters have framed the issue almost exclusively as free speech. Last week, when Florida Governor Ron DeSantis Boo. signed a bill into law that would make it illegal for social networks to deplatform candidates for elected office, he used First Amendment language. And in truth, nothing has happened since January 6th. It took away Trump's ability to speak and express his opinion. Indeed, on most days in recent weeks, he's taken to his blog to do just that. Last Tuesday, a day after DeSantis signed the bill, Trump published 10 separate blog posts on all manner of subjects. Really? 10? But yeah, did you know? We didn't no. know because like, nobody reads it. Right. What Trump's blog lacked was reach. According to the Post, Trump's blog peaked at 159,000 social interactions paltry by the standards of a man used to seeing social metrics in the millions. I mean, I get more social interactions than that on Twitter. Yeah. Well. And the peak arrived on his blog's first day. It has hmm. been downhill for the desk of Donald Trump ever since. That's what the <laughs> blog is called. Yeah, well, Trump and desks don't mix generally. Right. Generally, because it implies you're doing work. The right. disconnect highlights the actual utility of social platforms for Trump, especially on Twitter, where he focused almost all of his efforts. The power was not that they offered him a place to speak. Rather... It's they amplified it in crucial ways for free to a massive mm -hmm. worldwide audience. Twitter added Trump to its suggested user list and kept him there for years, even after he'd begun to promote the racist birth of conspiracy against Obama. Trending topics continuously highlighted Trump's latest outrageous remarks, mostly with that context, driving more attention. Ranking mm -hmm. systems turned to favor conflict promoted Trump's bile into nearly every timeline on the platform at one point or another. And it's true that Trump would never have attained the reach he got through Twitter were it not also the case that the entire Western media has the app open all day, often using the controversies found there as a de facto assigning editor. Yes. As with every platform story, social networks are not the only relevant actors here. A unified press corps that took Trump seriously as a mortal threat to democracy from the start 
rather than as a clownish sideshow that was good for ratings, may have given him less airtime. But after four blissful months of Trump-free Twitter, the platform's mm-hmm. value to him has never been more clear. Tweets are simply more powerful than posts on a website. They can be reshared to a global audience with a single click. They can attract new followers by the millions, and they can set the agenda for many of the world's most prominent journalists. Trump's rapid retreat from blogging highlights the decree to which he depended on free reach, not free speech, to advance his malign agenda, uh, which is, you know, yeah. interesting. You go back to when you and I were blogging, uh, you know, Please. and I, I still do the pundit roundup so at, at Daily Coast. But, uh, you know, 10 years ago, 12 years ago, 15 years ago, whenever it was, uh, back in the Iraq war days, we were just pissed off and just wanted to say so. Yeah. So it was entirely a free speech issue. And when Marcos uh, Melitza started uh, Daily Coast, uh, he had no idea that people were actually going to read what he was writing. True. Or that a community would form. I mean, that, that's all after the fact. It was just to, you know, nobody's writing about this. And, you know, it, it's uh, all freedom fries. And it's as if everybody uh, is supporting uh, the war in Iraq. And if you don't, there's something wrong with you. You're not patriotic. And you need another voice to say that's not really true with everybody. Mm-hmm. And by the way, they're wrong about a lot of things. And that's how the blog started. Yeah, and that's not in the least uh, what Trump is interested in, right? That's, I mean, yeah, you know, he pretty... could he could have whatever his opinions he wants, but if nobody reads it, he doesn't really care. He'll change his opinions to something that people will read, and if he's on a platform that nobody will read, he doesn't care. He'll drop it and he'll go to a platform that people will read him because yeah. he's all about the attention, which is not how blogging started, or whatever it evolved to, hmm. and uh, in a way. Uh, and this is not the subject of this particular piece. Uh, blogging has devolved back to where it was. It's just that now it's on Substack and you have to pay money to see it. <laughs> yes, that's pretty much uh, the the full evolutionary cycle. Just follow the history of Matt Iglesias. Mm. Yeah. Well, uh, yeah, that's a – I mean I, there's been plenty of writing about just how this blog is just not – working for him and not catching on and then of course the shutdown yesterday then by the way it also led to some speculation out there after the initial breaking of the news that it was shutting down but it was also that it removed all the content uh some speculation that uh, perhaps his lawyers had gotten to him and said you know there's an awful lot of incitement to insurrection and sedition on your blog and while we're stopping it because you're lazy and you don't want to do anything that isn't paying off for you you might as well just pull the plug and remove all that content too, and then and then say you never posted it. I don't mm. know. We'll see. Well, Casey Certainly Newton, case. who's writing this thing, fi- finishes up mm. at least the oh, part okay. we're going to do. Sorry to interrupt. By saying uh, four platforms. Okay. There could hardly be a more powerful story about the significance of amplification mechanics. By now, many of the platform executives I know are tired of the constant drumbeat of stories about how their network spread misinformation, hate speech, conspiracy theories, and other harmful content. But the Trump story illustrates vividly why they matter. For the worst actors on their platforms, free reach is almost the entire appeal of using them, which is really the whole point. And so, again, remember yesterday we talked about the different Q factions. And uh, today, yes. after the break, I think we'll follow up with a little uh, explainer from the same author oh. about how they fractured in the first place. Oh, OK. An origin. And, and so the, 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 um, the reach of those things is what matters. And that's why Facebook plays a much bigger role with the Q folks and with the insurrectionists, Mm -hmm. whereas Twitter played a much bigger role with Trump because all he was trying to do is get his voice hurt. With uh, the other groups, they are private groups that talk to each other, uh, and then they go public to recruit. With Trump, it's all about public. Hmm. If there's anything he says privately, it doesn't really matter. That's not how he functions. You know, he's all about the publicity and listening to his own voice. Yeah, well, that's a very that's a it's a great point, and I love the uh, the turn of phrase, right? Free reach, and and yeah, you're just piggybacking on the work that the platform and others on the platform have done to amplify your own work, and then yeah, ma- mistaking that for either one free speech or two your own genius, both of which could be uh, enormous errors. Because but it's tricky, we, you know, because yeah. like if somebody says something that is actual news, you'd like to talk about it. Like you sure. were talking at the very start of the show, you know, some really embarrassing things that Christy Noem and Greg Gutfeld are saying. But then if you retweet them, are you not amplifying them and just making them even more well known than they otherwise were? Mm-hmm. And how yeah. do you balance this 
in terms of informing people of what's going on with uh, not just uh, amplifying garbage. Yeah. Well, there's a uh, yeah, there's positive and negative aspects to it, I guess. Just like uh, I guess, just as uh, Mark Zuckerberg and others were sort of taken by surprise at their stupid little, you know, clubhouse, either uh, the original Facebook clubhouse for rating pictures of of coeds, or whatever Twitter thought they were getting into, and then suddenly realizing, uh, hey, this stuff's you know, going to make yeah, you a zillionaire. Yeah, that and could also destroy the world. And, you know, well, you know, first I wasn't first, counting on that. First, it makes me a zillionaire. Well, sure, obviously. Then, if the That's world is destroyed, part. I could just move to Mars, you know. Yeah. Right. Only Build a spaceship, right? Sure. That's what they're all doing. They're all working on that. Uh, but, yeah, and for a long time, they resist the notion that they have any responsibility for it. All I was trying to do was to give people a plat, you know, and their idea, their first idea might have been I want to give people a platform for free speech. And uh, that might have been a great idea, but then the success of your platform changes its nature. I don't think that should be so far beyond their understanding. But uh, I guess if you have a billion dollars, you can resist understanding for a very long time before the rest of us can force you into it. Still, you know, any of us who have been in blogging world or, or lived through any of that understand that, you know, as soon as you start to do that, talk about free speech, then you, you next have to talk about moderation and then uh -huh. how are you going to do that? Yeah. And, the, and then that factionalizes you and then, you know, people leave and then, sure. you know, it's we the natural history of everything. 11 times, 12 times, 15 times on Daily Coast. And of course, you become one of those things where you, you want to be able to continue to say, hey, I'm just a guy with an opinion. And then people say, you're a guy with an opinion that gets invited on TV because how many people share his opinions online? Okay, we've morphed into something else. It's just true. You got to recognize it. We'll be right back. Hi, everybody. It's me, David. Let's change things up from the old fundraising pitch for just a minute and talk instead about how you can be a part of our show. If you've got a smartphone or any other electronic recording device, why not sit down and record a segment for us? Read us an important article and give us your take. Read one of your own original essays or even just give us your commentary on something you'd like to share that's important to you. Then send the file to me at kgrowx at gmail.com and I'll try and work it into the show. Short segments, a few minutes in length, are easiest to fit in. And of course, I can't always guarantee that I'll be able to play everything, but if you've ever shouted at your radio or TV about something you wish was being covered, here's your chance to change that. Make the show your own. Send your submissions to me at kagrox at gmail.com. Welcome back now to the KGO in the Morning Show here on Netroots Radio. Greg Dworkin still, uh, we're only about mid-river with our Rafto stories. So there's plenty more to go, and we have a plan, I understand. Well, sort of. I mean, I, I just came across this Farhad Manju uh, tweet hmm. from yesterday. Nobody read his blog. His Newsmax interview was a dud. Reporters didn't even know his Facebook page was still up. And yet he's somehow still controlling an entire political party. Uh, yeah, I'm not certain how that happened i guess if you have no ideas and if i guess remember of course we've we have explained that everybody there uh in the in the party has to wait for the box to arrive with what's in it you know so we can figure out what to do and i guess they're just still in that mode and for whatever reason he has a mailing list and everybody's still getting boxes from the trump campaign except right. Liz cheney it's campaign in a box except uh, it's a different kind of box yeah you know, and so here are your what talking kind of points. And, uh, you know, I part of yes, it but I don't know what is mean. is just, uh, you know, forgetting about how parties used to work. Uh, interesting piece by Philip Bump we'll get to in a moment. Okay. But Patrick Chovanec, who's a conservative, but a never Trumper, uh, highlights a poll that was done by Center for American Progress. Uh, oh. and, and it talks okay. about what is the foreign policy priority for voters. Yes. And the top choice, which of the following issues should be top priorities for U.S. foreign policy in the next five years? And the top choice is protecting jobs for American workers, 47 percent total, Democrat, 38, Independent, 48, Republican, 57. That's a domestic policy issue. Uh, reducing illegal immigration is next at 42 percent. So is that. 20, 22 percent Democrat, Independent, 40, Republican, 65. <gasps> And then way in the distance is combating global climate change. Oh, our sanitation engineers are here early today. Hi, guys. It's all right. Uh, 
Yeah, that's striking in that, uh, yeah, I would have categorized the top two American foreign policy priorities as domestic priorities. Well, but, you know, that's what people are concerned yeah. about. Conservative uh, Patrick okay. Chopinick looked at this and said, what worries me most about the poll is that these are the fearful responses of a declining power. The lack of confidence here is palpable. In other words, protecting against terrorist threats is not that high. Ending U.S. involvement in wars is not that high. Improving relationships with allies is not that high. See, that's the top Dealing with one. nuclear threats, not that high. Stopping Russian interference, not that high. Fighting global poverty, very low. Of course. Promoting international trade, almost non-existent. And promoting democratic rights and freedoms abroad is only 9%. Well, we're not doing that well here with it, so... Right. And so that, that's what he means by that. So uh, let's go back to the 2020 election a little bit. Here's hmm. a catalyst uh, review of what happened in 2020, top line takeaways. Uh, and it gets back to why is the Republican Party acting the way they are? Number one, right. this was the most diverse electorate ever. Big turnout increases in communities of color, particularly among Latino and Asian voters. The electorate was 72 percent white compared to 74 percent white in 2016. 77% white in 2008, mm -hmm. and comes mostly from the decline of white voters without a college degree who have dropped from 51% of the electorate in 2008 to 44% in 2020. So okay. white, no college, still a big part of the electorate, but a smaller share. Okay. That's number one. Number two, Biden and Harris won with a multiracial coalition. You get a theme here? Mm. Why are Republicans so anxious? Because their base is shrinking. Okay. The Biden-Harris ticket benefited from a diverse set of supporters. 39% of the coalition were voters of color, and the remaining 61% were split fairly evenly between white voters with and without a college degree. They uh -huh. made significant gains among white voters compared to 2016, particularly among white college and white suburban, who have shown solid and consistent backlash against Trump's Republican Party. And the Trump-Pence ticket was much more homogeneous, with nearly 60% of the voters coming from white non-college. 85% white in total, only 15% voters of color. And so the very well discussed on this show and elsewhere, Latino voters continue to favor Democrats, but Republicans made inroads, which we've talked about. Black voter turnout increased substantially, resulting in significant gains for Democrats, despite modest overall support in Democratic uh, levels. And we talked about that on the show the other day. And the fact is that as the economy improves, a lot of those voters are coming home to Biden and the Democrats. Asian American and Pacific Islander voters saw, saw the largest relative increase in turnout, which benefited Democrats, especially in like the Atlanta area. The urban rural voting divide continues to be immensely important with suburbs growing more democratic and more racially diverse. Women remain critical to the democratic coalition. Young voters drove record breaking turnout. Thank mm. you to your kid. 2020's yeah. historic voter turnout gains were primarily driven by young voters, 18 to 29 which grew from 15% in 2016 to 16% in 2020. But the generational changes have been even more dramatic. Millennials and Gen Z now account for 31% of voters, up from 23 in 2016 and 14% in 2008. Meanwhile, boomers and older generations have been shrinking from 61% in 2008 to 44% in 2020. So us olds are fading. Millennials and Gen Z are ascendant. They are much less racist than their forebears, although racist still uh, to a certain extent. Uh, new voters made a difference, especially in Sun Belt swing states. And point number 10, there's still millions of non-voters who could cast ballots in future elections. And that's part of the deal with Trump because he gets non-voters to vote for him, but nobody else, which is part of the reason why, for example, uh, New Mexico won, won so heavily Democratic in uh, Tuesday's election, mm -hmm. which we talked a little bit about on the show yesterday. So with all of that, what you have is a very anxious electorate who realizes that their predominantly white evangelical point of view is in the minority and they can't win based on simply fair votes. And that's why election suppression and voter suppression is such a big part of the Republican Party. Now, Philip Bump writes the Republican Party is trying a new kind of politics. Uh, you may have forgotten, for example, the first presidential debate of the 2020 election. Trump faced off with Joe Oops. Biden in an encounter that was far, far heavier in interruptions and scoffing than debate. Uh, uh -huh. And then there was no second debate. Um, I only barely remember that, but OK, Trump, yes. Trump got the virus. The debate was canceled. Ah. 
They said, we'll hold it virtually. Trump said no. Hmm. Okay. And there wasn't another debate. And so now the Republican Party says, well, maybe we won't do debates anymore. No, oh, okay. No no votes, no debates, all the no troubles debates, and stuff. No platform. We're not going to have a platform True, anymore. I mean, right? the party That's is just out. changing. It's all about Trumpism and nothing else. Hmm. And in fact, uh, they highlight uh, our friend John Neely Kennedy from Louisiana. Uh, the mm-hmm. party almost necessarily remains beholden to the same vague aim. Last month, I noted the increasing frequency, this is Philip Pump writing, of candidates who don't articulate any platform besides the left is bad. And there you have uh, Christy Noam talking about you're canceling the fireworks because <laughs> the radical left hates America. Uh, 1619 project. Yes. Yeah. A central tenet of Trumpism. The left is bad. On Tuesday, Senator John Neely Kennedy announced his bid for re-election, offering only that as the rationale for having another six years in office. Come hell or high water, he said, your values would be my values. I will never be silent when the radical nut jobs tell me to sit down. <laughs> That's what I'm running on. Okay. You don't have to know anything else. Yeah. He mentions a socialist, he mentioned a nut jobs, well, but Kennedy's running is a bulwark against the opposition not to affect any particular proposal. That's and this shift box. away from defining policies and defending them to voters in favor of triggering more visceral concerns has happened as Trump and his party have rejected the idea that voters can be trusted in the first place. Trump's aggressive refusal to debate Biden happened in concert with his aggressive insistence that the election itself was tainted. By October, Trump had already invested months in false claims that rampant fraud would occur, an yes. obvious effort to rationalize any loss, and then he lost. And his response was to continue to claim that the election was stolen from him to amplify those claims. We just talked about amplification. Mm-hmm. See, there's a, a, uh, there's a theme a, here. A theme here, right? He embraced a wide range of obviously bad arguments about what had occurred and demanded his supporters, and again, trailing along behind his party, agree. And they did. And even after the insurrection, violence instric- inextricably linked to Trump's claims and rhetoric, his party focused on punishing those who had dared to challenge the claims, hmm. including uh, uh, Ronda McDaniel's uncle Mitt Romney. Yes. <laughs> and passing new laws aimed at restricting voting laws, treating those false claims as true. And perhaps worse, the parties also embraced changes to state laws that give partisan actors more say over evaluating the outcomes of elections. In Georgia, for example, it was the Republican elected officials who acted as a backstop to Trump's efforts to somehow wring a victory out of his loss. So other Republican officials, acting from the anonymous safety of the legislative majority, stripped power from those officials. Similar moves were made in other states, including Texas and Arizona, moves that would make it easier for a legislature to simply say the outcome of a race was invalid and should be set aside. So uh, when you step back and look at what Georgia and what Texas is trying to do and eventually will do when they get the special session, only now in the light of day, uh, you know, it's, it's, I'm not that concerned about uh, restricting hours, although it's pretty egregious when you do it like Texas did that said uh, you can't mm-hmm. vote during black church time. Yeah, You can only vote in the afternoon places. on Sundays because everybody knows morning votes are fraudulent. Afternoon votes are valid. Right. It's only after you've had lunch that you're able to avoid fraud. And also don't go swimming for an hour. <laughs> True. Yeah. I hadn't thought of mixing the two. But oh, it's a law. You shouldn't have it's my grandmother's law. Yeah, right. So, so uh, I don't know why you're not supposed to, but you're swim not supposed to. Swim up polling places are next. Something like that. Just everybody knows you're not supposed to swim after right. eating for an hour. Right, right. Similar moves are made in other why. states, Texas and Arizona, yada, yada. See, the thing is... Uh, I'm not as worried about uh, making it difficult to vote. This pisses people off in the vote anyway. Mm. I am and was and will be a lot more worried about, oh, and by the way, forget about whether or not you can have water online or pizza served for you. Oh. The real issue is that after the vote is done and we lose, we'll just say, ah, we suspect there was fraud, so nope, doesn't count. Hmm. Well, I guess that's enough. If you can run without a platform and just be the anti Whatever guy. Right. So as uh, Bob says, this is a toxic combination, claiming that rampant fraud exists when it doesn't undermine confidence in the actual demonstrated will of voters. Going back to Brendan Nyhan's point about, you know, uh, prominent voices say this, do get people to uh, 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 trust the election less. And that's what the entire Fox News platform is for. It is a propaganda mm-hmm. arm that's basically trying to destroy American democracy. It's not hyperbole. They're trying to undermine your faith in elections. And 
basically, if somebody says, well, I don't believe any of this stuff, the election was stolen, they're Fox, they're Fox viewers. Yeah. That's where they're getting Almost that view certainly. pounded into them every OAN. single day. That's... By people like Greg Gutfeld that you started yeah. the show with. Uh, true. And I guess reinforced by people like uh, Kennedy running for elected. I was going to say, uh, I, I, it wasn't that long ago, uh, and it also has been going on for decades, that... Uh, pundits would come out and, and write, uh, you know, huffy, sighing pieces about how it's not enough to be anti-blank. You got to be for something. And that's only, well, I guess, us Democrats. We got to be for something. It's not enough to just simply say what you're against. But now we'll, I guess, see whether that's really the case. Uh, although being against things has decided presidential races, uh, Senate races all the time. Uh, Whatever, I guess it's, it's, it's insufficient for Democrats. They have to show something else. Uh, but you can win a whole Senate seat, one of only 100 in the country, by just saying, I don't know what they're for, but I'm against it. You know, whatever it is, I'm against it. Okay, that's a legitimate platform. That yeah, the Gretchen Martin platform. That. Right, yeah. I learned something from your citations of all these things over the years. Right. I knew there was a lesson in it. Thank you. All right. Uh now what? The country collapses? Uh, I suppose. So uh, how does it collapse? So okay. let's go back to this explainer about QAnon, because that's oh. the background behind why all of this stuff has so much appeal. You have people who are worried about the direction of the country, who feel their white majority is changing. They can't really handle the change. Mm. Uh, a lot of these folks live in rural areas uh, where they don't have to come in contact with a lot of minorities, even though there's plenty of minorities in the rural areas. But uh, it's much easier to control what goes on there. Uh, and so they don't feel as threatened by it. But they still feel threatened because, you know, the big cities and crime and all that sort of stuff. Yes. Well, you know who does ground. crime in big cities. Right. All the ones that have been burned to the ground and no one lives there anymore are rife right. with crime and overcrowding. So this explainer, we did Somehow. the QAnon factionalizing uh, uh, what those factions were yesterday. Yes. Uh, today is how did it happen? Okay. Uh, and the author here writes, the first time I really started thinking about the factionalization of QAnon was in May of 2019. News broke on 8chan that major QAnon <laughs> promoters in The Matrix and Shady Grove had oh. booked a paid speaking gig at Ramtha's School of Enlightenment. What? And other major QAnon promoters, Neon Revolt and Joe M, completely lost their minds about it on Twitter for several days. Oh, my God. It's Ramtha right. is a Scientology-esque group, and Q people are being recruited to speak there and being paid, and that's going to look bad for the movement. Now, Ramtha <laughs> is a New Age cult compound in Washington State where a woman right. named Jay-Z Knight claims to channel a 35,000-year-old Lemurian warrior to bring uh, messages of truth, wisdom, and guidance to her followers. What is Lemurian? Uh, we well, got to go back to Mu and Atlantis, oh. you know. Maybe, uh, it, no, you know, no. lizard people. Oh, uh, there's a link uh, to Wikipedia. OK. All right. Great. I can read it on my own. Uh, yep. I don't think it's a thing. Though his concern about QAnon gradually becoming more insane would be yes. proven ultimately correct. Joe M would lose <laughs> this fight. Ramtha wasn't even the first time this sort of thing had happened a year earlier. Wow. The introduction of JFK Jr. into the Q mythos ah. had provoked a similar reaction. And just a few months after that. Flat Earthers started joining the movement en masse, further <laughs> enraging right. many in the community. Oh. Is now, there a big remember, foot JFK thing? Jr. is still alive. JFK Jr. and Flat Earth caused yeah. so much internal strife that the Flat topics Earth. were both brought directly to Q in the famous, <laughs> infamous Ask Me Anything on December 12, 2018, oh where God. Q told their followers directly, JFK Jr. was not alive and the Earth is not flat. Okay. He only answered 16 questions during the Q&A. With the followers, and four of them were just to settle long-standing arguments within the community. But what the Ramtha incident in 2019 drew into sharp focus was that as QAnon grew larger and more diverse, the old guard of original followers and promoters was getting deeply resentful about the movement becoming entwined with these goofy fringe beliefs. And the irritation would build up over time, and every few <laughs> months would boil over into angry Twitter diatribes about how this theory or that theory was stupid or insane or was being pushed by grifters, or was bringing shame onto QAnon by making them all look ridiculous. And that pattern has persisted ever wow. since. 
Well, congratulations. Maybe you are a political party. Right. The pattern has persisted ever since. <laughs> Maybe you're just bloggers. Yeah, the right. pattern has persisted ever since. Just last they week during the pets? Evergreen container ship incident. Oh. Remember that one? Yeah. What happened with that? That was a. I mean, I know. I remember the the real incident. What does Q say? Yeah, it's... we talked about the name. At why is it called Evergreen? Why are they all Evers? You know. Mm-hmm. Noted steak oil salesman Jordan Sather felt the need to call out other Q promoters for the ridiculous theories. And if Jordan Sather, who pushes secret anti-gravity engines, remember we talked about the technology people, oh. and MMS okay. theories onto his audience is calling you out, there's a deeper problem. So here's Jordan Sather on Instagram. I'm hearing from sources, young people have been rescued from the Evergreen ship. It came from China. The captain said the computer system went black. And the ship went full speed onto the bank. Space Force took control and crashed it on purpose. A global warrant is now in place for all of Evergreen's cargo ships. It's the first marker of the finality. Q said a year ago, watch the water. And when you do need a plumber. <laughs> and therefore, this is all real. <laughs> okay. Right? Space Force, and, though. And, Jason, go. and Jordan Sather said, wait, this is going viral. And he's hearing from sources. Okay. Okay. Anything is possible in searching for truth. Message sure. over messenger. Do your research. The vision. What yeah. other phrases can you think of that people try to cop out with? So how did QAnon get to that point? To really answer the question of how and why QAnon started splitting into factions, here are a few things to remember. One, QAnon adopted a survival strategy based on evangelism and recruitment. Grow as large as possible, as quickly as possible. And it exists entirely on the Internet. Mm-hmm. So they, you have to be interpreting what these Q drops are by others to have real meaning. That's why Watch the Water has to somehow refer to Evergreen in the canal. Sure. I mean, it's three You wouldn't know Watch surface, the Water would mean that. Somebody has to tell you. Right. Uh, right? And, and QAnon have established celebrity promoters that, who become financially and emotionally dependent on the movement and their audience. And that's a perfect recipe for factionalization. So by focusing so heavily on growth... Remember, there's a lot of people that believe in QAnon. That's what we started yesterday's show with. Right. That uh, 14, 15% of the population buy into this stuff, 22%, 23% if you're a Republican. QAnon had simply run out of people to recruit who didn't already believe a bunch of other wacko stuff. And so when you bring in people in a heavy growth movement, they're going to bring their wacko stuff with them. So when you start recruiting people, they already believe that JFK uh, was assassinated by a government cabal mm-hmm. and that we never really landed on the moon and that the earth is flat and all these other things that, you know, people believe. And so they just bring that with them and then they glom it onto Q. For shame. And that's how it grew. And when it grew that way, mm. you have people saying, wait a minute, of course we landed on the moon. You're crazy. Wait a minute, we didn't. And so you factionalize. And that's how it happened. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, are there any other uh, good old... Conspiracy theories out there that haven't been revived, you know, as uh, uh, artisan, <laughs> locally sourced artisan. Well, you know, uh, 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 if you follow the Beatles, Paul is dead. What you have to yeah. do is you have to play all the songs backwards. Ah, ah right. So they could have one of those in there. Uh, I know you mentioned the moon landing, but I mean, like, obviously, it's do the green place, cheese one? It, or? Yeah, I, I guess. It, I mean, I'm just waiting for what other things can be. Uh... Gives you an idea how old I am. You go back to that one. <laughs> the, I, I, yeah. Remember on Abbey Road, Paul was not wearing shoes. Oh, and right. That that's the kind of thing that. Well, that's exactly right. People have been doing this for a very long time. Just uh, the only thing that's new about it is that it happens on the internet now. How did people communicate their secret wacko beliefs that because he wasn't wearing shoes that meant he was dead in those days? Yeah, there wasn't an internet then. You had to do it by word of mouth. And yeah, also, you know, uh, radio. Yeah, okay. All right. Well, I guess you could do it that way, but we didn't uh, We didn't cancel what's, what's those What's the frequency? <laughs> I guess. Man. Uh, all right. So the only thing that's really changed is the speed and, and I guess the reach. Back to the reach story. Yes, exactly. And that's why, you know, all of these uh, separate things kind of all, you know, tie together. Hmm. It's all about reach. But at the same time, just when you uh, read the uh, large numbers of people that believe X or Y, don't forget, uh, a lot of them are infirm believers of it. It doesn't necessarily uh, dominate their life. And if it gets too much bigger than what you're reading, then it just falls apart and they factionalize. Hmm. I guess. 
And just like a political it. party, exactly. Yeah, it, it, that really began to strike me. Well, well, people who are original to the thing began to, you know, get upset about the newcomers bringing weird ideas and orange hats or whatever. And uh, uh, okay, I can see how this happens. And that that's the that's the life cycle of a political party. It's right. It's and the next disturbing. thing you know, Nevada is having primaries and not caucuses. Right. Q is uh, on the ballot, and who knows what. Uh, yeah, well, entertaining story. And right from the outset, I had to laugh as you were saying, well, how did they factionalize? Well, you see, somebody wrote on 8chan. Oh, 8chan, not 4chan? Yeah, that's right. Now, they had already moved on. Yeah. I don't know if they're doing 12 or 16chan. I don't follow these things that closely. Uh, who knows? You know, uh, probably uh, I think at some are. point uh, when it's, you know, uh, uh, things are a little bit uh, calmer uh, in his life and in our life, uh, we should have Dave Neward on to explain a little bit about uh, some mm. of the uh, right wing stuff that he follows and how that ties into, uh, you know, some of this, because uh, it, it's it's a similar story with malicious. And uh, again, so. it's a matter of reach. The difference is that uh, if you kick people off platforms like Trump and they go underground, that's bad for them. If you kick malicious off of platforms like this and they go underground, that's bad for us. Because then you can't follow them and you, they still communicate. Hmm. And it's, it's one of the reasons why these private Facebook groups are just so dangerous. Yeah, I guess so. I mean, it doesn't mean that mommy bloggers dynamics. can't talk to each other uh, or that, you know, you can have a local uh, neighbors uh, group and such. But the platforms really are obligated to police this a lot more than they do. And they don't. They don't regulate it. Mm -hmm. And uh, they basically uh, let fascism happen because it's good for them yeah. and it's good for their bottom line. Well, people found a way of exploiting the abilities of these uh, uh, the, the re to use the reach of the platforms and to use the micro targeting of the platforms and where it was invented as a way, like you say, to let, well, let mommy bloggers talk to each other without getting in everybody else's face or whatever, or just have privacy from people who are pestering them, which is also a huge problem on the social media platforms, but, um, yeah, I, you know, people take things and use them for unintended purposes and the unintended consequences arise, micro targeting, uh, either fake news or advertising for a campaign and just saying, we'll just tell this group that we're for position a and that group that we're for position B, or we want to, you know, an annihilate this ethnic group, but tell the other ethnic group, we want to annihilate the other one and see if it works. Hmm. Well, anyway, that's my hmm. rant for today. Okay. Well, I'll be back Monday. Monday. Monday's not another holiday, is it? I don't think so. I'll check the calendar, but uh, who knows? I'm sure it's it's always National Something Day. We should take off for one of these things and celebrate it. Make it a good one. Yeah, well, that's what parties used to do. Yeah. Now, now they just run against whatever it is that you're trying to get uh, right. uh, National Something. Sure. Uh, yeah, and I guess it works. Whatever it is, I'm against it. Okay. Uh, I, I am amazed by the fact that that has happened. But then again, you know, like I said, you made it full circle with your your whole rant. I'm I'm fascinated now by the dynamics of the factionalism in QAnon, and how it parallels, you know, actual political parties and party organizations. It's just, I guess, the only difference is if you are talking about things that are really happening on this planet, you go a little further. Well, you know, that's my job to make you think. Okay. Well. And my job is to resist it. It's working. <laughs> I'm against it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I'm going to win, too. Okay, I appreciate it. Well, thank you. That's a, that's a hell of a start. That leaves us with uh, Well, just, thank you very much, and thank you, son, for voting and for getting vaccinated. Mm -hmm. Now he's all part of that new generation that's just changing anything and get off my lawn. Yeah, <laughs> I guess so. Uh, all right. Well, I will. I'll do that. He's up early today. I don't know. There, some game company is releasing something today, and now that's very exciting. Yeah. And this well, that's important. You know, hey, my kids voted. Up before and noon. My kids got vaccinated, and uh, they're part of this uh, generation too. A little older, they're in their thirties, but still, you know, it's all part of that movement that's uh, coming. And uh, it's why I'm not as completely uh, pessimistic about the 2022 election as everybody else seems to be. Mm. I think the Democrats have an uphill battle, but they have a, uh, it's competitive and they have a decent chance to win. And part of it is Republicans are really that terrible and they're going to lose the suburbs. Well, okay. So maybe that's the messaging we need to make for the generation of new voters too. Uh, you remember how awesome it was when you voted and you got rid of the terrible people? Yeah. We, we could again. do that again. You know, you don't have to wait until 2024 to do that. 
Oh, by the way, there were some interesting crime statistics that oh. came out. I posted on it yesterday. I don't know if we talked about it on the show. I can't remember, but uh, that was yesterday, and it's just too long ago. Right, so the, uh, there's just no evidence whatsoever that this defunding the police or crime stuff really matters to people. Hmm. Not the way they vote. Oh, okay. Not that, you know, it cool. matters in terms of trying to uh, construct an argument. But in terms of how it affects voters, no. Uh, and so you have Republican Hooray. conservatives who are just like devoted to the idea that crime is going to change everything. That uh, riots mm. uh, over Black Lives Matter stuff, we're going to lose Wisconsin and Minnesota maybe for uh, Biden, which never happened. And when you ask people now, and this polling out now, and maybe we'll talk about it on Monday, uh, crime is just not up there in terms of what people care about right now. Okay. Yes, they always okay. care. It's always there. It's always background. You live in a city, you're going to be aware of it. New York City had a debate yesterday, uh, and they have their primary coming up on the 22nd and uh, of, uh, of June. Right. And uh, we'll see what happens. But uh, crime is going to be a part of the discussion, but it's not going to be the entire discussion. It's not what everybody is like solely focused on. Mm. And so what people care about is different than what people care about exclusively. When you have exclusive cares about it, then you have a powerful movement. And when you have, yeah, I care about that, but also like nine other things. Sure, I care about crime, but also yeah. whether or not we actually landed on the moon and uh, <laughs> whether there are actual angels that you can take pictures of. And also... Uh, yes. You know, it really matters to me whether JFK is still alive or not. But, uh, you know, on the other hand, uh, I, I'm going to vote for the Democrat because, like, whatever. Uh, all right. Well, I, I like I'll having uh, food on the table and a good economy. Uh, if you're Where into do I stuff fit? like that. Based on that. <laughs> uh, that's crazy. That's like too old timey. Although pretty soon, if you hang on long enough, everything old timey becomes um, uh, artisanal. Or I suppose you could pass off as steampunk somehow. I don't yeah, know. Or, or uh, organic, <laughs> you know, in which case you can charge more for it. Right. Uh, we're back to having milk delivery these days. Uh, that's uh, new and bespoke. And salsa. All right, welcome back now to the Kegger on the Morning Show here on Netroots Radio. Trying to keep one eye on Twitter for news stories, but instead, of course, I'm being distracted by foolishness and screwing around on the Internet, like uh, uh, things Bill is tweeting about. All right, and I, then I was admonished for it. This was a very interesting exchange that actually relevant to the show. Uh, it was just uh, Bill noting the uh, the weirdness of, what was it? Uh, who's what? The, the new airline or a new uh, boutique uh, airline? A, a what's going on here? So uh, I guess the idea of bringing back supersonic uh, aircraft for commercial airliners, and I guess somebody's idea for doing this uh, is, is out there. And well, let's see. So what's the uh, what's the actual story here? United Airlines, it says, will purchase. Up to 50 of, uh, I guess the name of the company, Overtures airliners, these supersonic airliners, and fly the fleet on 100% sustainable aviation fuels, which sounds like a good idea. Except the name of the plane itself, the model, I guess, of the plane that they're selling to United Airlines is, uh, and I guess, I gather that it came from the fact that it's a supersonic jet, they're calling it. The, the boom, you know, there's a sonic boom that goes along with breaking the sound barrier. Boom. But uh, Bill, like uh, some others have uh, observed, that maybe boom isn't a great name for an aircraft. That's probably true. I figured it was because Kablooey was already taken. But uh, then I was admonished by Bill. Aren't you? Uh, you should be paying attention. You're doing a radio show. You need to focus on these things. And I was able to tell uh, Greg in our break on the way out about the whole exchange because the fun part of it was I got to say, I'm not doing a radio show. Greg's taking care of it. I'm on break. So feels like I had a good uh, hour off in the morning. And uh, believe me, it hits me on Fridays as I wake up and I contemplate heading down for one more show. I say, I'm close to the weekend. You know, it should be easy to get through the show and then realizing, oh, yeah, Greg won't be there to do the first half of it for me. All right, we have to wait for Monday on that. But that gives us a chance to read all those weird esoteric stories, sometimes out of the uh, realm of the usual politics and things that take 100 years to read all the way through. Uh, oh, look at this. Uh, that's interesting. I wonder what, uh, what it was. Let's see. 
I have uh, a notice here from YouTube that says your content violated YouTube's community guidelines and has been removed. And I don't really have any YouTube content except the um, the the uh, the the tapes of the show, the podcast. So the May twenty sixth, twenty twenty one show, and you know YouTube will never tell me. I'm sure uh, why it thinks that it violates policy or who says it violates policy. But let me see what they have to say here. It's curious. So the May 26, 2021 show is is banned forever from the Internet's YouTube. So oh, the thing to do with this, I think, if I were a Republican, I would say, now you can directly buy and download the forbidden May 26th episode for just, you know, I don't know what it should be, $5, $50, $100? Is it a collector's item now? Let's see. We know this might be disappointing, but it's important to us that YouTube is a safe place for all. If content breaks our rules, we remove it. You know all about that. Um, Somewhere it says why. How your content violated the policy. It won't be. I think it'll be generalized. YouTube does not allow content that spreads medical misinformation that contradicts the World Health Organization or local health authorities medical information about COVID-19, including on methods to prevent, treat, or diagnose COVID-19 and means of transmission of COVID-19. Learn more here, which now means, you know, okay, somebody said it violated it. What did I even talk about? I have no idea Uh, how this affects your channel because it's the first time. This is just a warning. If it happens again, your channel will get a strike and you won't be able to do things like upload, post, or live stream for one week. What to do next? We want to help you stay on YouTube, so please make sure you understand the community guidelines and strike basics. Review your content. with our, How do I review it if it's no longer on? All right. Well, I have tapes of it, too. Um, now I'm just curious, uh, and I know I can look elsewhere and find out, generally speaking, what topics we covered by looking at the summary, although sometimes it's uh, more about making jokes about the content we covered than anything else. What do we even do? Oh, uh, let's see. Armando was on. Maybe it must be Armando violated the policies. All right, we have to fire Armando. What do we do? That was last Wednesday. And let's see. Uh, We had, I mean, wouldn't that be something if it was Greg's segment that allegedly violated the COVID-19 rules? I doubt that's the case. Maybe it's an offhand comment I made as a joke about some of the things he said. What do we even talk about? Let's see. Uh, It was the anniversary of George Floyd's death. That wouldn't be it. And uh, hmm, Donald Trump knew those Chinese were up to something. Of course, most of the time, Donald was... mm -hmm, Okay, yeah. Oh, so it might have been the Wuhan lab leak thing. Isn't that interesting? Uh, And interesting. So here we were... This is amazing. Were we criticizing... Tom Cotton's attempt to lay blame for the virus at the feet of the Chinese bioweapons lab. And we said, no, that's ridiculous. Uh, It's possible that something could have started in the lab, but the idea that it was released as a bioweapon seems outrageous. Of course, if that's it, then we're now in trouble again because we'll be saying this again. But um I wonder whether it was a malicious report from, you know, right wing trolls who sometimes do this sort of thing. Justice could tell you all about that. He's been harassed off of Facebook a hundred times by saying stuff like, I don't, you know, I don't think people should listen to you because you're a Nazi. Nazi, that's hate speech. How dare you call me a Nazi? And it gets reported and the algorithms, it, no, there aren't people taking care of this stuff. It's algorithms take care of this stuff. And you know, I say he said Someone was a Nazi and it's mean to tell people that they're Nazis. And they're able to tell from a quick review with the algorithm that the word Nazi was used. So that's enough for us. We'll suspend you. And uh, if, I don't know if you want to appeal it. Go ahead and maybe we'll listen to you. And in about a month, we'll figure out something, something. And I wonder if that's what did it. I'll have to look into it. So that's it. Breaking news. Uh, something, something, and the May 26th episode is now a collector's item, and you can buy it direct from, you can still download it from Libsyn, by the way, but you can uh, you can also opt to uh, contact me about uh, the best way to send me $100 for a, I don't know, an autographed copy, for instance. Why not? I read just the other day 
that the guy who the insurrectionist who got arrested for uh, he was the one who had his feet up on Pelosi's desk was uh, I'll dig up the tweet note to self to look for it. But he was selling autographed pictures of himself, you know, with his feet up on Pelosi's desk for a hundred dollars, which his lawyer must have just loved. Uh, uh, but, you know, whatever. I guess there's no rules and anybody can do anything, I guess, so long as you're Republican. So, all right, we'll just uh, see if we can figure things out. Uh, we'll focus on it after the show, figuring out why we have had our May 26th episode pulled for COVID misinformation. I'll have to re-listen to it, I guess, which is one of the most boring things you can do is re-listen to yourself. But uh, actually, Greg and Armando filled, I guess, the bulk of that show. So I guess I'm off the hook. I'll just listen to them. All right. Uh, we haven't mentioned to this point for whatever reason, just because I guess it's just not that interesting to me personally, because I still have hamburger in the house. But a Russia linked group is reported to have been behind the latest ransomware attack to shut down uh, core industry in America. First, they shut down the gas. Then they shut down the meat. Who knows what's next? Uh, I don't know. Probably a, a good idea would be to say, uh, Russia, if you're listening, the Tannerite gender reveal party industry is extremely important in American politics. And I think we would collapse as a nation if we didn't have access to that stuff. You know, so I don't want you to shut that down. Please don't shut that industry down with ransomware. Just thought I'd throw that one out there. Um, some interesting news, apparently, about, the, well, again, that the, they're Russia-linked. And it's not meant, we're not meant to take away from it that they are connected to the government the way some of the other Russian-linked hackers have been. But, you know, they operate in the uh, uh, oligarch-controlled kleptocracy. And uh, sometimes there are connections to the government that are not meant to be viewed as, um, you know, that this is an official arm or operation of the government, but uh, they are happy that things like that go on and are pleased to look the other way and just enjoy the show. But Bloomberg has a report on, uh, I guess, the, the strange nature of these beasts and, and I guess their relationship, uh, shadowy relationship with people who have themselves shadowy relationships with parts of the government russia linked group behind jbs attack revels in its audaciousness jbs uh one of the largest meat packers i guess in the country and responsible for some significant portion particularly of the pork products uh distributed in the country jamie tarabay reporting this for bloomberg uh just yesterday they patronize hacking forums to recruit affiliates, advertise profit-sharing schemes, and provide interviews on their techniques. I need to talk to these guys about uh, about uh, privateers of the Caribbean. I've always wondered about whether or not you could hire guys like this. If they seem to be able to shut anything down remotely, I would like to talk to them. Since they are, I mean, I guess I don't have to incentivize them with profit sharing schemes or they won't think that that's innovative anymore they're already doing it so they'll be expecting a profit sharing scheme if i can just get them to cut off the internet connections using i guess using ransomware that would be a fine suggestion of offshore banking facilities such that we can hold the uh funding in place and isolate it on these offshore havens and then go in i guess virtually and siphon the stuff off before it can be moved or protected and uh you know billions maybe even trillions of dollars waiting out there to be scooped up and uh, distributed through profit sharing schemes although <clears throat> you know the reality of it is you don't want to get involved in any of this stuff not just because it's the wrong thing to do but because at some level someone will just say well if i just murder the person who came up with the scheme i get a bigger share of the profits and that usually works out poorly. Anyway, who are these groups? According to Bloomberg, and who knows how good the reporting is, but I'll go with it. I, it's more than I know about people behind this. Um, I don't know whether this, how they pronounce this, but it's spelled out as though it were R, like 
letter R, R evil, R E V I L, but with the R and the E capitalized. Do you want to pronounce that as R evil or revil or revel or what? I don't know. They're Russians, so who knows how they pronounce it? The R is, you know, our R, not the backwards one. The Russian linked hacker group that the FBI said is responsible for the cyber attack on JBSSA, the largest meat producer in the world. Oh, sorry, I sold them short a minute ago. Has emerged as one of the most prolific and public ransomware groups in recent years. The hackers are also known by a different uh, group name, which looks to be unpronounceable for me, but uh, Sodin, uh, the, the parts of it are uh, S-O-D-I-N, Sodin, O-K-I-B-I, and I don't know how they break that up. It might be S-O-I-D, Sodi Nokibi, Sodi Nokibi, Sodi Nokibi. I have no idea where they uh, would put the emphasis on that, but S-O-D-I-N-O-K-I-B-I, and that's why everybody's going with our evil instead, I guess. This group has been at the forefront of the ransomware as a service model of cyber attacks. I don't know what that is. Since the group first came to prominence as a security threat in 2019, in this model, hooray, now we'll find out, hacker groups provide malware for others to use in an attack in exchange for a cut in the ransom payments. That's very clever. In order to recruit talent, our evil, I guess, deposited $1 million in Bitcoin as a way to give potential affiliates peace of mind that they would get paid. You can't have a lack of confidence among thieves, right? There's no honor, but, you know, I want you to have peace of mind. But that's just so I can murder you later. Remember, there's no honor. Audaciousness is part of their persona, said Alan Liska, a senior threat analyst at the cybersecurity firm Recorded Future Incorporated. What a curious name that is. And uh, there are so many... Uh, cybersecurity firms out there, too. There's a new one for every story. Ransomware has become a thorny problem for the Biden administration, I guess, particularly after an attack last month on Colonial Pipeline Company squeezed fuel supplies along the East Coast. It really didn't, but you know that story already. Other recent attacks have targeted the police department in Washington, D.C. I hadn't really heard about that one. A hospital network in California, and now a major... Every time I see that, I have to do it in his voice. Major meat supplier. Okay. Ransomware is a type of hack in which a victim's computer files are encrypted, rendering them unusable until a ransom is paid. Some ransomware groups steal files, too, providing another avenue for extortion. Our evil, or whatever they call themselves, however they pronounce it, maintains a page on the Dark web page, that's what it says. It maintains a page on the dark web page. Maybe that second page wasn't necessary. Probably the story originally read, Our Evil maintains a dark web page. And they changed that to a page on the dark web. And then left the page accidentally called the Happy Blog. Obviously just a joke. Where it leaks or auctions sensitive documents from victims as an extra incentive to pressure them to pay. Since 2017, ransomware has, be, has come to dominate other financially motivated cyber attacks in volume and profitability, said Kelly Vanderlee, senior manager of the analysis, oh, senior manager of analysis at Mandiant Threat Intelligence. Part of, if you thought this was a brand new one, no, it's part of FireEye Incorporated, which we've heard before, but equal, it just is about as dumb as Cyber Ninjas name wise. While the attacks aren't limited to a particular type of victim, meat, gas, cops, whatever, available data suggests it disproportionately affects the manufacturing sector, Vanderlee said. Uh, There are likely several contributing factors, including the perception that manufacturers may be more likely to pay to prevent monetary losses from uh, production downtime, she said. Interesting. Our evil, or whatever they are, emerged from the former Gand Crab Group. That's sort of crammed together as one word. Capital G, capital C. Gand Crab? A ransomware as a service outfit that announced they were closing up shop, an actual shop, in 2019, according to CrowdStrike. Remember them? 
CrowdStrike Holdings now, though. CrowdStrike Holdings Incorporated. Not just CrowdStrike, but the parent company, CrowdStrike Holdings, Inc., which was confir- which confirmed sorry, that our evil was behind the JBS attack. We are getting a, a well-deserved retirement, Gand Crab wrote, according to the cybersecurity blog. <sighs> the name's in this thing. Krebsen Security. That's not so bad. We are living proof that you can do evil and get off scot-free. Dang. I wish there wasn't proof of that. But, you know, there is everywhere. It's not clear if the operators of Gand Crab simply rebranded themselves with a new name. Why not? Or if our evil's operators bought or stole Gand Crab's code. That's an interesting angle on things. Either way... By the time Gandcrab signed off, our evil was already underway as a more exclusive ransomware program that was also known as Sodin, there we are, or Sodinoko, you know, Sodino Kibi, Sodino Kibi, Sodin, I guess that's how you know how to break up the word, Sodin Okibi, or Okibi, hmm, well, I assume that's Russian, and it means something. And I think somebody was tweeting that they looked it up and had a rough translation, but it didn't make any particular sense to them, uh, and it was never going to make any sense to me. In, that's an interesting thought, though, the idea that their, their ransomware was stolen, and it might be a face-saving way of, of getting out of the business, like we're going to retire, as opposed to admitting that uh, we were out hacked and another hacker group stole our ransomware and is just going to ransomware us into non-existence we can't admit that so instead we'll say we're retiring like the dread pirate roberts or whatever and just handing our software or you know whatever interesting okay in may of 2019 a representative of the group going by the nickname unknown that's a great nickname sought out a small number of partners on hacking forums for a new ransomware as a service program. Five affiliates can join, five more affiliates can join the program and then will go under the radar, according to Krebsen Security. Each affiliate is guaranteed 10,000 in U.S. dollars. Your cut is 60% at the beginning and 70% after the first three payments are made. They have a whole system worked out here. Reminds me of uh, one of the first articles still parked, I think, in my uh, pocket account that I shared years ago was the uh, the corporatization of the cocaine cartels and how they were, you know, running themselves as a very professional outfit and uh, doing all the analysis a, a normal business would do. Um, they're not quite there with ransomware, but they're trying. So your cut is 60% at the beginning, 70% after the first three payments are made. Five affiliates are guaranteed $50,000 in total. We have been working for several years, specifically five years in this field. We are interested in professionals. They advertise sharing profits and providing infrastructure and ransomware, ransom negotiations and the distribution of funds, said John DiMaggio, chief security strategist at Virginia-based Analyst One. They handle all the Bitcoin transactions and things of that nature. Like many of the more established ransomware groups, our evil researches potential targets to ensure they have the means to pay, including determining if victims carry insurance against cyber attacks, he said. A our evil associate said in an interview that targeting firms with cyber insurance was, what, quote, one of the tastiest morsels. All right. Sounds interesting. Our evil took credit for hacking the hardware supplier Quanta Computer Incorporated earlier this year, and in the process, published secret blueprints for a new Apple device. Hmm. Sounds fun. In 2020, our evil executed a ransomware attack against a law firm that they claimed once represented some of Donald Trump's television enterprises. Now, if you could get the tapes, that'd be worth it. In 2019, the group also attacked a group of Louisiana election clerks a week before Election Day. Hmm. Our evil is so immersed in the ransomware domain that its members weigh in regularly on discussions about malware on hacker forums, according to DiMaggio. They also maintain direct relationships with other ransomware groups, including DarkSide, the hackers accused of being behind the May attack on Colonial Pipeline, he said. When DarkSide's site went down after the colonial attack, 
Our evil alerted the hacking community about it, said DiMaggio, who has long studied Russian cyber criminal gangs. They're extremely involved. They're the kid in class who always has to raise his hand. They're very vocal in the community. DiMaggio and other analysts have said that our, oh, well, this time they didn't capitalize the E, but Revel, but our evil or Revel hackers communicate largely in Russian, well, they're Russian, and steer clear of targets that use Cyrillic script, the system for languages of Eastern Europe and Slavic states. In the interview, our evils unknown said the group avoided those countries because of geopolitics, laws, and patriotism and the possibility of getting killed when they catch you, I guess. The arrangement also gives Russian President Vladimir Putin plausible deniability against accusations by the White House and others that Russia is involved in the attacks. The whole ransomware model fits into the tactics we've seen from Russia over the years, DiMaggio said. The appeal for hackers is potentially big profits with minimal risks. As a child, I scrounged through the trash heaps and smoked cigarette butts, yum, a person claiming to be our evil's unknown, said in a March interview with Recorded Future. These guys are interviewing me? All right, I don't know whether that's a good idea or not. Uh, I wore the same clothes for six months in my young, I guess I mean in, in my youth, in a communal apartment. I didn't eat for two or even three days. Now I am a millionaire. I guess you can see the appeal, even though, you know, the story could be entirely untrue. Uh, very interesting. Just wanted to sort of keep up with it because uh, ransomware very much in the news and I'm not entirely sure I understand it. And that was a new angle on it, I think. Uh, the idea that you could develop ransomware software but not actually conduct ransomware attacks yourself. I don't know whether you're just nervous about doing that stuff or you can basically rent out your ransomware software to others and they'll conduct the attack and then you just negotiate the ransom for them uh i like the idea of doing it as a service model i mean it's just very interesting i don't like the idea of ransomware don't do it all right what other uh things need discussion well we are almost up on the break here so maybe we'll just throw in something relatively quick and then uh, set up a plan for our last segment here I guess the quick thing will be uh, my enjoyment of this Vanity Fair short piece on Jimmy Kimmel and his treatment of, as he says here, the insane idea that Trump thinks he'll be reinstated. This is the uh, the portion of the 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 process where the crazy idea uh, makes it all the way to the late night television hosts who make fun of it. And that usually crushes the thing. And then sure enough, this morning on Fox News, the job for the Trump troops was to get out there and deny that the whole thing had any substance whatsoever. As a matter of fact, maybe I can grab that uh, clip from Fox News just to let you hear the tenor of how they handle it. But uh, I probably won't be able to get it before the break. Jimmy Kimmel, though, is aghast at the insane idea that Trump thinks he'll be reinstated. This is in Vanity Fair. Chris Murphy Made this short road up. Uh, let's just get right down to it. Ted Cruz, he says, must be breathing a sigh of relief. After dragging the Republican senator on multiple occasions last week, Kimmel lit into Donald Trump and a slew of his cronies during the opening monologue on Tuesday evening's edition of his show. It's Jimmy Kimmel Live, in case you didn't know. But before he roasted the former president, Kimmel lit into 90s rapper Vanilla Ice. I didn't realize it was going to take this detour who performed at Trump's 2020 Mar-a-Lago New Year's Eve party for trying to honor fallen troops on Memorial Day by sharing a photo of a teenage mutant ninja turtle draped with an American flag. I don't know how that was going to work, but he's vanilla ice, and I guess we don't really care. Uh, Thanks, Thank you for your service, dudes, said Kimmel. Uh, I don't know whether that, what, what the, the message from Vanilla Ice actually said, but... What a weird thing to do. Anyway, point here is Kimmel then moved on to soon to be imprisoned congressman, as he called him, Matt Gates, who was duped into retweeting a photo of Lee Harvey Oswald in uniform. Did you hear about this one? On Memorial Day by Intercept reporter Ken Klippenstein. I did manage to catch that one. Anyway, that wasn't what we brought. We came here for. We were uh, here for Kimmel also taking on Trump's 
disgraced former national security advisor, Michael Flynn, or who he calls the pardon pal, uh, who recently appeared on QAnon conferences in Dallas, or as Kimmel called it, QAnon Con. At the conference, Flynn was asked why the violent and deadly military coup in Myanmar, which uh, the question poser pronounced Minimar, couldn't happen in the United States. And of course, he said no reason there. Uh, that wasn't even why I came here. But we'll have to now wait till after the break for that short bit. Boy, this really confused me. Hi, it's me, David Waldman, your host for Kigro in the Morning. I have good news to report. Many more listeners like you are making critical contributions that keep our show on the air. Makes good sense, of course, and Patreon.com, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com, makes it simple. Now you can make easy, secure, recurring monthly contributions to support our show. Patreon.com slash KGROX gets you straight to our donation page. Maybe you'd like to thank us for helping keep you sane during the Trump era. Maybe you're looking forward to in-depth explanations of what's going on in the Biden administration. Whatever it is that keeps you listening, we need your help to keep bringing it to you. And hey, if you happen to prefer using PayPal or even the Square Cash app, we're up and running with those options too. Thanks again, everyone, for all of your support. We literally could not do this without you. All right, welcome back now to the Kid Growing the Morning Show here on Netroots Radio. Now, uh, I guess now I can get around to what I actually went to that Ki Jimmy Kimmel report for. I guess they stuffed it full of other things before they got to the headline nugget. But there was another funny joke uh, that he made about Mike Flynn, super spy Mike Flynn, uh, pointing out here. Let's see. Flynn later tried to walk back his statements endorsing the idea of having a, a military coup here in the United States. Uh, <clears throat> you all probably watched him do that, but I, and by the way, I would remind you, I mean, I know that became big news that he was walking it back and, and now that there are, uh, uh fans of his out there attempting beyond all reason, of course, cause it was all videotaped to insist that no, he wasn't actually endorsing having a military coup in the United States. I, I do remind you, this is the guy who pled guilty to lying to the FBI and then decided to plead not guilty instead and fire his lawyer and switch the whole thing and uh, on top of it all, accept the pardon for the thing that he was guilty slash not guilty of doing, which was lying in the first place. And so I don't know whether you can really trust the guy in all of this. But at any rate, uh, it was interesting to see Kimmel uh, taking shots at him or hear about him taking shots at him. Kimmel says he wasn't buying it, saying, except for this weekend when you did it on video, you weren't uh, endorsing coups. And sometimes you did it, uh, the times you did it leading up to January 6th. But the joke here, Kimmel continued to lay into Flynn, a.k.a. General Lisenhower, as he called him. I kind of like that nickname for him. All right. And uh, also adding, maybe there should be a coup down at Myanmar Alago. Get it? Okay. What we really came here for, though, finally, was Kimmel's note that the New York Times Washington correspondent Maggie Haberman has reported that Trump believes he'll be reinstated as president in August after Arizona finishes that cyber ninja audit of the election they're doing. Apparently, that's a quote from trump himself somehow that bit of news he said is so completely insane and dumb it has to be true we'll know for sure it's true once we hear trump deny it right just a joke or uh quite prescient well we haven't heard trump himself deny it but he sent his daughter-in-law out to do that and i cued this uh clip that bobby lewis had grabbed for media matters earlier so that i could just play you the audio let's see if i can actually make that work though i think i'll have to go to the original can't do it out of pocket and uh let's see if we can pause it for just a second right here at the beginning and then turn on the sound and see if it rolls i know you're considering okay. running for uh, uh for senate in north carolina again this is lara trump being interviewed here so one of the hosts says i know you're considering running for senate have you forgotten that that lara trump is considering running for Senate in North Carolina. Remember, for a while, they were saying Ivanka would run for Senate in Florida. She's out on that so far. Um, no word yet on when Lara Trump uh, says, Psh, I'm not putting myself through that crap. 
But all right, here she is uh, being interviewed on Fox and Friends. What about this story that President Trump is, is thinking that he's going to be placed into office in August? Is that true? Has he mentioned that to you? Because I think 24 hours a day, other networks are running with that story. Uh, well, I, I think you should take a look at who those networks are and who is pushing that story out. Um, as far as I know, there are no plans for Donald Trump to be in the White House in August. Uh, I, maybe there's something I don't know, Brian, but but no, I think that that is uh, a lot of folks getting a little worked up about something uh, just because maybe there wasn't enough pushback, um, you know, from the Republican side. So, no, I have not heard any plans for Donald Trump to be installed in the White House right. in August. You just blew up all their programming for the next 72 hours <laughs> i know you yeah so all right i mean i guess that's the new uh, approach to this thing is that uh duh, we didn't tell maggie haberman that uh it's all made up by the lying news networks and uh, now they'll have nothing else to do all right well we were warned jimmy kimmel saw it coming and uh not surprising it was uh, telegraphed a hundred times already so let's see other things that uh need some attention today let me uh perhaps go over to uh, one of the latest installments from Greg Sargent and the Plum Line, uh, bringing up, you know, a, uh, a touchy point, quite true, though, uh, and something we really have to pay more attention to. We've mentioned over the past couple of days, a couple of times, positions taken by the Biden DOJ, which I attribute to well, one, which are terrible, and which I attribute to the um, the usual and long and longstanding uh, institutional preference for safeguarding executive power. I mean, they're part of the executive branch, and the usual position is that even if you don't necessarily agree with the policy being disputed, the position of the DOJ is generally speaking to defend maximum power and maximum flexibility for the executive branch in all things on the thesis you know on the theory that you are usually dealing with a non-crazy president and though you may disagree with how far somebody would push the uh, whatever policy that's going on whatever is being disputed um that it was the right of the president to to do so, and you needed to uh, uh, defend the right of the president to have maximum flexibility in instituting it. However, now that we've had a crazy president, it might pay to uh, reevaluate re that. But uh, unfortunately, the reevaluation at DOJ has apparently been, well, we're not likely to have another crazy president, and so therefore maybe it's okay to not rein in the executive here just because it was once demonstrated that a crazy president could be uh, excessive in his exercise of this power. It won't happen again. It reminds me of the Simpsons line, of an early one. I guess the one where uh, Krusty gets framed for... Uh, Whatever the hell he was framed for. <laughs> so I forget what it was. It was a very early episode. But remember the one where Sideshow Bob is the one who sets him up. And uh, yeah, the, afterwards, when he's exonerated, thanks to Bart and Lisa's you know, quick thinking or whatever, and, and uh, Chief Wiggum apologizes to him. He's like, I'm really sorry. You know, we screwed that up. Uh, won't happen again. <laughs> Just like, okay, whatever. Uh, more important, though, what Greg actually had to say about this stuff in the plumb line, his piece, the Biden team is making terrible excuses for keeping Trump's secrets buried. And I think I agree. As the Biden administration increasingly resists pressure to release various documents, this is a new angle on things, that would shed light on the depths of Donald Trump's corruption, you'll be hearing a key excuse a lot. And the excuse is, we need to restore normalcy. It's a terrible excuse, and we shouldn't stand for it. And we shouldn't, and it's just a restatement or a, a rebranding of look forward, not backwards. Uh, you know, and to this extent, uh, or, or in this regard, uh, where people have quipped or complained that Biden's presidency is really a third Obama term, 
Um, well, you can flip that on its head. This is actually the first Obama term. <laughs> They're taking the same approach to calling out and uh, finding account, pursuing accountability for the crimes of the previous Republican administration under the same guise, but with a different catchphrase. We need to restore normalcy. It's an important, or in an important piece, CNN reports that congressional Democrats are increasingly pessimistic that the Biden administration will release some highly sought documents that would help settle some big unanswered questions involving the former president. CNN has new details on the thinking of administration officials here. They say release will hamper the restoration of normalcy by relitigating past battles. Again, looking backward, not forward. I'm curious. I got to click on the link here to see what documents we're talking about. Let's see. House Democrats still pursuing Trump's uh, tax returns, but the Biden administration may not play ball. Interesting. Uh, so again, uh, yeah, that's not going to play real well. Remember when we delayed getting them? And, oh, well, now, you know, we, we dragged our feet for so long and pursuing them. And then, all right, well, now he's out of office and the Biden administration will surely turn them over. And guess what? They're not going to. And once again, we find out that uh, Congress has no subpoena power. And uh, I guess that's one of the things still worrying me in the back of my mind. Like, well, OK, we can't get the presidential or not the presidential, but the outside commission with subpoena power, although there were doubts about how powerful the subpoenas really would be with equal division of the of the commission. Don't worry, we can still do a special committee in the House. The House has a majority. They can pass this thing. They can have subpoena power. They can even give themselves a numerical advantage on the committee, and they'll have subpoena power. And it's like, where have you been? There's no such thing as subpoena power. You should know that by now. Anyway, long story. Uh, so where were we? Yes. CNN has new details on the thinking of administration officials restore normalcy by refusing to relitigate past battles. This won't do, says Greg Sargent. Helping conceal Trump's misdeeds from public view will not restore normalcy. The opposite is true. Lack of transparency will help prevent a restoration of normalcy. That is, it will help prevent a restoration of normalcy we should actually value. Hmm. Good point. Two sets of documents are at issue here. I mean, I guess you could restore normalcy. The normalcy is Americans generally sleepwalk through political crime all the time, and we should restore that normalcy. No. We want to restore a normalcy worth returning to, where people are held accountable for their crimes. Two sets of, I guess maybe we never had that. Two sets of documents are at issue here. First, the Justice Department is under pressure to release a legal memo detailing Attorney General William Barr's rationale, and that's in scare quotes, for not charging Trump after the special counsel examining the Russia scandal documented that Trump likely committed extensive criminal obstruction of justice. Second, House Ways and Means Chairman Richard Neal of Massachusetts, Democrat, of course, has been suing for the release, half-heartedly, I'd say, of Trump's tax returns from the IRS. All this came after Trump unprecedentedly refused to release them himself and his Treasury Department followed suit. In both cases, the Biden administration is resisting. The group Citizens for Responsibility and Ethics in Washington, crew, is suing to get the Justice Department memo and after a federal judge ordered its release, the department indicated it would appeal. Meanwhile, the IRS still won't release tar Trump's tax returns. Neil recently told CNN he is still pursuing them, and negotiations with the administration are ongoing over a possible deal. But sources close to Neil worry this could linger on forever. And the bottom line is that the Justice Department, which is defending the administration in the tax returns case, hasn't changed positions from the one under Trump. Here's how the Justice Department officials justify their reluctance. And there's a quote here from uh, CNN's reporting on the topic. Justice officials tell CNN the department's leaders have tried to cast the current administration as restoring normalcy after four years of Trump interfering in the nation's top law enforcement agency. Part of that effort, the officials say, is refraining from using the department to relitigate controversies from the previous administration. Hmm. Greg says this doesn't wash. It's true that Trump turned the Justice Department into an arm of his political and personal corruption, trying to wield it against foes, 
pressuring department officials to protect him and relying heavily on Barr to spin, deflect, and distort to disguise his extensive wrongdoing. But it would be a crowning perversity if this fact were then used as a justification to prevent the full truth from coming out about those very same misdeeds. Yet the idea that we can't, quote, relitigate these, quote, controversies means precisely this, because we supposedly shouldn't revisit those matters. We cannot learn the full extent to which the government under Trump was perverted by his loyalists to facilitate and cover up his corruption. The legal memo on obstruction could very well reveal that the Justice Department developed an obviously fraudulent legal analysis to justify not charging Trump. More broadly, as Joyce White Vance details, Trump's level of presidential interference in the machinery of justice undermines the rule of law in a very profound way. Concealing one of its most heinous episodes is unthinkable. But they're thinking about it nonetheless. With the tax returns, the Trump administration violated the law which requires the Treasury Department to furnish them upon Congress's request. Democrats don't need a rationale, but they offered one anyway. They need the returns to exercise oversight over whether the IRS enforced a law, the law impartially over a president and to determine the full extent of Trump's financial conflicts of interest as they weigh legislative action to safeguard against future presidential abuses. To be fair, there are genuine complications here. There are reasons the department would want to protect confidentiality on charging deliberations and why it might want to protect the executive branch's prerogatives. You can also see why officials might think they can best demonstrate impartial conduct at agencies by avoiding the appearance of fighting past political battles. But in the end, our interest in fully understanding the uniqueness of the situation carries more weight. I understand the instincts pushing the administration in this direction, Noah Bookbinder, president of Crew, told me, they want to model independent agencies that aren't being used for political purposes and aren't targeting enemies. They feel like that can restore some faith. But, Bookbinder noted, the Trump era brought us a fundamental corrupting of the federal government for the benefit and advancement of a president. If you don't find out what happened and get some accountability, you're not going to deter that kind of thing from happening again, Bookbinder said. The burial of Trump's misdeeds is not behind us. Large swaths of the GOP just killed a full accounting into Trump's incitement of a mob to subvert our democracy through intimidation and violence. The effort to cover for Trump and avoid accountability is ongoing, Bookbinder told me. We can't have normalcy without establishing what happened and consequences for it. There is no way to restore the sort of normalcy we should value other than to have the fullest accounting possible across the board. Normalcy without transparency and accountability is not worthy of the name. Very true and very sad that we find ourselves in pretty much the same position I was commenting on Twitter yesterday. It's like we're doing the whole thing all over again. I remember very clearly in 2009 being uh, given the opportunity to visit the White House and being able to tell President Obama point blank, if we don't do something to call out and demarcate what just happened in the last administration. And ironically, I called it in my post about it, called it Cheneyism, as opposed to Bush Cheneyism. But, you know, this was chiefly driven by Cheney. And now here we are, Cheney's political successor, his daughter, is supposedly some kind of hero for maintaining, you know, our belief in the American, you know, truth, justice in the American way, when her father should likely have been charged for all of his activities under the Bush administration. But Cheneyism at that point, as I was conceiving of it, was basically the anything goes approach to governance, that we can do anything we want and find some mechanism by which we can either justify it or bury an inquiry into it. And ironically, it has come back uh, to uh, not only haunt us and destroy, possibly destroy America, but it might take his daughter down with it. So I don't know what to tell you about that one. But just generally speaking, my big concern after that or during and after that meeting in 2009 was, look, 
uh, if we really seriously take this approach of no looking backward, we got to look forward, we got things to do, et cetera, et cetera, especially when one of them was the Affordable Care Act, and that seems to be on the bubble every 10 seconds in its very existence in front of the courts. But, uh, you know, we got things to do, we got to look forward, not backward. Well, you know, what the upshot of this is, is that the very next Republican administration is going to pick up exactly where this one left off and do it a lot worse. And guess what? It did. I was right. I wasn't the only one that thought so. Everyone who thought so was right. Is exactly what happened. And amazingly, as we're being told, that uh, the great benefit of the Biden administration is that we've learned the lessons of the past, uh, either from dealing with Republicans in Congress or uh, how they will approach the Biden administration. Of course, they'll be doing everything they can to make sure it fails just the way they did with the Obama administration. Thankfully, it didn't fail, but it was a, it was a, a quite an, well, I don't know what to tell you. It was quite an annoyance to, to, to understate things a little bit, but uh, yeah, I, I wrote uh, on the 10 year anniversary of that meeting and revisiting that meeting and, uh, and the disappointment uh, that I experienced then and was experiencing now, uh, being proven right by the very next Republican administration, I said, you know, uh, hey, I hope we don't make the same mistakes over again once we finally get rid of this Trump administration. But guess what? It looks like we're going to. How exciting is that? All right. Well, that's a bit depressing, but at least it's not Friday and I don't leave you with that for the weekend. Uh, there's a little bit more time to pick up on a few more or one or two more stories here. Uh, let's see where to go. Uh, no, more on ransomware. That's of interest, perhaps. Um, as long as we're doing throwback reporting. How about this? Um, I was intrigued by this story. Uh, but do I have access to it or not in full form? Probably not because uh, it's in the uh, paywalled, prote paywall protected section of talking points memo. But just uh, we can at least uh, throw out the concept of it for further discussion. I guess since we uh, threw things all the way back to 2009 uh, looking for uh, prior Red flags from the GOP. Here, here's an even older one under the title of Thunder in the Distance, Josh Marshall writing, with Texas Democrats refusing to attend a state legislative session in an effort to block the state's election crackdown law, right? It reminded TPM reader MR, just going by the initials, of a similar instance 18 years ago. It was a story I covered closely at TPM and MR dropped me a note this morning. That was yesterday morning to remind me it's more than just a trip down memory lane. What happened in 2003 in Texas was a preview prologue to almost everything that would happen over the subsequent two decades. It presaged the debt ceiling hostage taking Merrick Garland and Donald Trump. And as we know, from looking forward to the 2022 midterm, once a decade, there's a federal census, a reapportionment of congressional seats and redistricting in every state that has more than one representative. It happened in 2010, setting the groundwork for Republicans storming back into the majority in the House. Democrats rightly fear something similar will happen next year. That's where the story cuts off. But uh, the story is basically the one of the very, f I guess, well, at least in this chain of events, the first really uh, egregious norm challenging from Republicans when Tom DeLay, then the Republican whip in the House, uh, put together a project pushing Texas to redistrict again mid-decade simply to gain further partisan advantage in the makeup of the Texas congressional delegation. And this was the first time everybody said, well, that's not when you read, you don't redistrict in the middle of the, uh, in the middle of the decade, you do it once a decade right after the census and everybody, you know, having it dawn on everybody. Oh, well, you know, that's, it does say that we're supposed to do it once a decade. Uh, well, 
after the census. We're supposed to do it after the census, which the census happens once a decade, but there's nothing that says you can't redistrict more often. And I guess that was true. And they went ahead and they actually tried to, to do that. Now, I wish I had the whole story available to me because my recollection of everything was a little bit hazy. But I guess the reason it reminded them of you know the, the walkout uh, and the denial of a quorum in the Texas uh, legislature reminded them of this earlier episode because as they were trying to push through, I think it was the redistricting plan that DeLay wanted to see implemented. The Texas Democrats in the legislature did the same thing and sought to walk out and deny the legislature the quorum it needed to do this business. But it was then that delay, I guess, prevailed upon the Bush administration to involve the Department of Homeland Security in hunting down the Democrats who had not only skipped town, but then were forced to leave the state in order to escape the clutches of uh, the the uh, law enforcement mechanisms inside the state that were being put to use by the then governor. Was it Rick Perry at the time? I can't recall. But uh, they left the state so they would be beyond the reach of Texas jurisdiction. And so DeLay tried to federalize the search for them and bring in the Department of Homeland Security, which was brand new at the time. But we are, you know, not even... A couple of years had passed since its formation and people worrying about what does it mean to bring this new security apparatus and lay it over an already over surveilled American populace. And what would happen if all the powers were giving it to fight terrorism were instead turned to pacifying domestic enemies instead. And, you know, within five years of its creation, it was within one year of its creation, I think, it was being used to do just that uh, to, well, not to the surprise of any Democrats who uh, watched along the way. Well, I guess there were some Democrats who actually went along with the uh, the whole project, not the abuse of it by delay, but the idea that, no, 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 this will never, there's, there will be adequate oversight. Besides, we have subpoena power. No one will ever get away with any of this. All right. Very interesting. Uh, I'm it's too bad I don't have more of the uh, the item available to me because of the paywall, but I just want to sort of remind you of that. I guess uh, last thing I'll mention, just because uh, we're wrapping up but we haven't uh, given it any time, is the uh, letter signed by a hundred uh, poli- uh, what, what do we call them? Uh, uh, parliamentary and historical experts pointing out the extreme danger in which the Republican approach to governance without actually having to win elections puts us, and the call for the uh, um, the uh, a- abolition, I guess, of the filibuster at, as a possibility and as a mechanism toward passing adequate protections at the federal level against uh, voter suppression and the progress the Republican Party is making towards cementing some sort of mechanism for permanent minority rule in this country without having to actually win elections. Very dangerous. Put together a letter. Uh, I'll I'll link to it so you can all read it if you haven't, but I believe you probably all had a chance to do that. And uh, I just wanted to, you know, once again, bring up the fact that, yeah, it might turn out to be extremely important that, Uh, teaching people that the filibuster was conquerable and was capable of being abolished if you could put the political will together to do it, that it could be done by a bare majority. And I guess that could become some very valuable lesson. And possibly even, as they say in this letter, and people who were writing about the letter saying, saving democracy by eliminating the filibuster so that we can pass this legislation. It would be nice to have had a hand in saving the country and saving democracy uh, and to have done it all from my own home, which would be a nice thing to do. And uh, I guess uh, next uh, up, I guess for Friday's program, or perhaps next week, we can all discuss what we would all like to have at the luncheon following the awarding of the Presidential Medal of Honor to all of us dirty hippie bloggers who made this possible. But of course, first you have to actually accomplish the thing, 
And that, sadly, is up to politicians and not us. So I guess we got some work ahead of us. Uh, and I'll have to put my head together with Joan at some point to uh, flesh out the campaign that we thought about on Tuesday. I do think that there's a real possibility for getting people to move on the filibuster, even without winning votes, if we just have somebody on hand ready to uh, go through the uncomfortable but important work of appealing the ruling of the chair next time a majority votes for cloture, but we don't reach the 60 vote threshold. Maybe we just want to have a different precedent that says, eh, 60 is not the number. It's no more or less difficult to do than the original nuclear option because it's, of course, exactly the same thing. All right, time to sign off for today and hand things over to Justice Putnam for the West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Let's see what he's got on tap for the time we have remaining here. Just over a month ago, Trump met with a tech CEO who helped organize so-called patriot caravans from around the country to the insurrection on January 6th. Well, we're putting a timeline together after all. From NetworksRadio.com You have been listening to KGRO in the morning with David Waldman. Mitch McConnell, who everyone still hates, considers it an exotic notion, apparently, to cite the year 1619 as a key historical moment in American history because there was a lot of slavery going on around the world during that time. In other words, what about ism with regard to slavery? How exciting and unexpected for Mitch McConnell. Stay tuned.